What's up, guys? It's KB. Make sure you subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Click the bell icon down below so you don't miss a single video from us. And thanks for tuning in to another video from Underground Sports Philadelphia. Now let's get into it. Philadelphia, baby, you're going to love it. Best sports fans in the world. Actually, the worst, but that's what makes them the best. These we got breaking news, brother. You said breaking news. Breaking on, news on OTB. Hey, yo, what? Breaking news. What is going on, OTB Nation? Welcome into episode number 313 of the award nominated, honorably mentioned, number nine NCAA ranked. And of course, viewable on YouTube outside the box podcast, the official lacrosse podcast on the Underground Sports Philadelphia Podcast Network. It's KB coming at you from Underground Studios and joining me as he does every single week. My trusted co-host, my sidekick in this game, my big dog, my breaking news companion, that is Coach Deach. What up? Hey. Do you know how many days we are away from Coach Deej? Count it down. We are four days away. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Four and then on away. Monday, Coach Deej is back out on the field. It's day one of practice. And we only got nine practices before our first game this year. So, Or excuse me, eight practices. Ninth, ninth day is first game. So we told y'all we had breaking news. We're four days away from Coach Deach. <laughs> no, that's not the breaking news. I mean, that, that's some breaking news. The, the we coach... also have breaking news on the show. Two PLL free agent signings, according to yours truly. Two different teams. By the time you're listening to this, they have already been put out on the socials. Uh, but maybe you're not on social media and you just listen to the pod, so you'll get them here first. Uh, but before we get into all of that, make sure you're following us on the socials at OTB Laxpod, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Threads, Facebook.com slash Underground Sports PHI. Follow DJ on Twitter at SCS underscore next great. Follow me at KBIZZL311. Subscribe to the podcast feed on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts in audio form. Leave a five-star rating and review. It really does go a long way for helping the show continue to grow. Helps more people find OTB. Helps more people find Underground Sports Philadelphia. And we know a lot of y'all are listening. I know it's been us playing catch-up, getting episodes out, and y'all are still listening no matter when we put them out. So we greatly appreciate that. We just want more of you. We want more people to join in with OTB Nation. So come through, subscribe to the pod in audio form, leave a five-star rating and review, and of course, subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Underground Sports Philadelphia. That's where you get this show in full video form every single week. You get every show in our network in full video form, live streams, original video content. We put out our, our Underground Madness hype video, including myself and Deej in that bad boy. And uh, you're going to get March Madness live stream watch alongs this whole tournament long. It's going to be a doozy of a time. Obviously, when PLL draft rolls around, we're going to be doing our annual PLL draft extravaganza. Um, so live streams galore will be coming on the YouTube channel. And Deej, I'm going to drop some knowledge that I haven't dropped for the people. I haven't even dropped it to you. So, obviously, we have one more OTB Radio interview that will be included in this episode with BC, Brendan Coleman, head of the PLL app, who got us hooked up with our code, OTB Pod. Uh, but I think it makes sense for us to also streamline and put those interviews out in their own individual videos. They're going to go on the already existing Outside the Box Podcast YouTube channel. Why are you just now telling me that? <laughs> how, because how long, how long you made our, our channel? I have a channel for all of our shows. Had to get that username. Y'all y'all hear this? Y'all y'all know the same amount I know about this company. 
Y'all okay. know y'all know the same stuff I know. We find out everything at the same time. This guy. This guy. Hey, Deej, here you go. When everybody else gets it, you would think I'm. You would think I'm not. You know, the the vice president of content of this business. <laughs> think that, that's my my title since I don't know anything, but it is. It is. I'm the vice president of content, and I just found out that we got a YouTube channel for OTB specifically. So hold, I don't know anything. Hold the okay. I don't either. I could have sworn I had texted you the link when I made this. It would be in our links. I know. Could be wrong. But yeah, there is an OTB YouTube channel. That's fine. There's there's barely anything on it. There's I, I think fine. two or three shorts from when I was at Wings Media Day last year. Um but I think it makes sense to put the interviews on there um in full video capacity. So we'll uh we'll link the channel in the description so you can subscribe over there as well. Don't unsubscribe from the main channel though, because that's where videos are going to be. But if it's OTB centric stuff like sit down interviews, like OTB radio type stuff like that, we're gonna also put them up over there. But full pod episodes are staying on the main channel until further notice, just so everybody is aware. I like just that another setup. channel for you to subscribe to. I like that setup. So subscribe to the OTB YouTube channel. I believe it is youtube.com slash OTB Lax Pod. I'm going to confirm that right now as I type it in my search bar, youtube.com slash. That is exactly what yes. it is. YouTube.com slash at OTB Laxpod. You are on that channel because the I, clip. Of, I know. Uh, I see it. People. I see it. Um, I'll go run that up. It's just, it, that should be our most viewed piece of content because I'm I got to put, hilarious. I got to put that on the main YouTube as well. I put, I, I post shorts on our, our like brand YouTube channels just to build the channel currency instead of having to attach a phone number or an email to things. Uh -huh. Um, if you build up your currency, it allows you to post longer videos in the long run. So I would, I would post stuff on there to help make the channel live um we got 10 subscribers over there though so subscribe to both youtube channels uh and get your merch phi apparel company is the place to do that shirts hoodies you name it they got you covered if you're a philly sports fan they got you covered and of course outside the box podcast merch underground sports philadelphia podcast merch it is all available at phi apparel.co and when you go to check out use our code underground for 10 percent off your merch orders it is the most effective and direct way to support everything we're doing here at underground sports philadelphia and with otb so subscribe 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 and get your merch get your merch get your merch phi apparel.co code underground 10 percent off your order deej we are going to talk nll but i feel like we need to lead the show off with our true breaking news for the people two goalies have signed with their respective teams. One is a re-signing and one is an extension. The California Redwoods have re-signed goalie Jack Kelly through 2025 per source. As told to me, Jack Kelly and the team has made it official since I have put that out in the universe. The other breaking news is... Per source, friend of the program, multi-time friend of the program, recurring guest, if you will, Blaze Reardon, goalie for the Carolina Chaos. He ain't going nowhere. He has signed a three-year max extension with the Carolina Chaos through 2026 per source. So Blaze is staying down in the Carolinas, and they lock up that core because – not only is Blaze signed through 2026, but obviously Jack Rowlett, Josh Byrne, Chris Cloutier, 
wouldn't shock me if Jared Newman's next. My biggest thing with this is you got to lock up. You know, the, the most important pieces. When you're looking at chaos, they have been extremely busy in this free agency already. How do you guarantee success moving forward? We talk about it all the time. Special teams. They're mm -hmm. called special teams for a reason. Your goalie and faceoff are uberly important, as we're finding out in every fashion of lacrosse outside of sixes. Faceoff doesn't matter too much, but we're finding out in every fashion of lacrosse from box to professional field to college that your special teams win you the game. That includes your man up and man down as well, as we're seeing teams that are struggling with those are starting to struggle in other places as well. You got to lock up those pieces most importantly. So grabbing the best goalie in the league is important. So keeping him locked in, I find that arguably the biggest move in all of free agency so far. Granted, it was just an extension, but this has been like that the biggest like blockbuster move so far. I think right behind this is a lot of what we've seen with the woods. Like they're basically clearing house. Um, and some of those moves were unexpected and quite large, but they're starting to make sense. And then with this Jack Kelly signing, clearly they didn't go longer than two years because they're probably going to be looking for someone to replace Tim Troutner, who they let go to Atlas. Most likely will be doing so in the draft rather than free agency. So he's staying most likely for the next two years to help garner that new rookie at goalkeeper into the league, letting them know kind of how PLL things work and giving them tips. So whoever that goalie may be will be ready when it's their time to step in cage. Or they put him in right away, and you see Kelly kind of revert to that Brian Phipps, Austin Cott role where they're there, super vocal, pointing out things on the sideline, always have the iPad, but also – there to give support and and knowledge to that rookie goalkeeper. So there are some pieces there at goalie and some moving things around with the woods, but going and locking up a guy like Blaze Reardon is what free agency is about. You go and make sure he does not reach free agency because what you don't want to do is be in a battle for a guy like Blaze Reardon. Because sure, he loves chaos, loves the locker room, wants to be there, likes playing for AT. But if other teams start calling and they have the right numbers, there's no guarantee he stays in that Carolina Chaos jersey. He might pack up ship and go somewhere else. So locking him in like this keeps him in the jersey that you want to see him in. Yeah, I think the two biggest moves agree is Blaze and then another goalie move too that happened earlier was Dylan Ward re-signing with the Water Dogs. Having those two guys locked up long-term, Dylan Ward also signed through 2026, like – those are two big time moves for those franchises to have your back end secured in front of two of the most elite defenses in the league. You know, you have Jack Rell at Jared Newman. Uh, and as we're recording this, we also had breaking news. Um, I'm going to pull up here to see the length of time. Uh, no details announced yet, but uh, Johnny Serdick back with chaos as well. So you have that defense plus um, Will Bowen is is part of that defense as well. So like Chaos have that that whole core locked up. Same thing with the Water Dogs defensively. They re-signed Liam Burns, Eli Gobrecht, um, and a bunch of guys are still under contract. And I'm pretty sure some extensions, just by a hunch, are on the way for them as well. And then they get Dylan Ward. Lockdown. Those are our two massive moves for two teams that have championship aspirations and continuing that that winning way. Um, but yeah, breaking news to the pod: Jack Kelly re-signed with the Woods, Blaze Reardon re-signing and extended with the Carolina Chaos. We'll talk some more NLL free agency later in the pod, but let's talk some NLL. Deej. Week fourteen in the books was quite the week. Uh, I took in as much as I could. I was obviously photographing the phenomenal musical put on by Buna Regional High School with Matilda was absolutely amazing. We sold, I believe, over 700 tickets across the four shows, which for a small school like Buna, if you don't know, typical graduating class size for Buna is about 100 to 120 kids. Very small school. So to have that number of ticket sales come through was awesome. 
Um, but week 14 in the NLL went a little something like this, Deej. Uh, redacted, somehow hung on and beat Halifax 12 to 11. San Diego squeaked one out in overtime against Panther City 10 to 9. Toronto beats Las Vegas 16 to 11. Vancouver with a big time upset over the Bandits at home. They win 13 to 12. Philadelphia Wings get it done on Marvel Day 11 9 over Calgary. Albany takes down New York 14 to 8. Saskatchewan absolutely pummels Colorado 15 to 7. Toronto takes down San Diego 15 13. And then Rochester goes on an absolute nuclear tirade, puts up 19 on Panther City and win 19 to 15. Just taking a look back at our picks as well, which we will have pick graphics back this week now that we are fully caught up. Don't you worry, they're not going anywhere. Um, we both had Halifax winning, so we we lost that one. We both squeaked by with San Diego against Panther City. We got Toronto correct. We lost Buffalo. I got the wings correct against Calgary. Both got Albany. We both lost Colorado. You got Toronto correct over San Diego. Uh, and then I got absolutely embarrassed by picking Panther City to beat Rochester. But them's beat a breaks. It was a good week of lacrosse. I think it was telling for a lot of teams. Um, NLL trade deadline is is approaching, and I loved this tweet. I don't know if this came across your timeline or not. I did retweet it, um, but our good pal and future friend of the program, uh, Cody Jansen, I want to pull up his word by word here. Um, so the NLL official account tweeted yesterday, on Wednesday as we record this on Thursday. Uh, we're closing in on the hashtag NLL trade deadline. Who do you think is on the move? Cody ret or quote tweeted and said, the trade deadline is March 12th and Saskatchewan will have played 50% of their regular season games. While after this weekend, certain teams will be 78% done. I get scheduling isn't easy at all, but fans will never get a busy trade deadline day like the NHL until this gets balanced out. And I could not agree more. I a hundred percent agree it. There has to be some evenness and some sense of urgency around the amount of games, right? Like the perfect way to solve this. I don't know, do an all-star game in the middle of the season. Like everybody else does. Ha. Ah, then you boom, you put, your trade deadline right before the All-Star game, or you make it right after the All-Star game, which, okay, either one is fine, but then teams start to really find out, okay, the halfway point, we're right here, but that's also everybody else's halfway point too, so other teams are looking to make changes and stuff all at the same time. A team that's 78% done with their season, nine times out of 10 already knows what they want to do moving forward. They're either like, all right, this is what we've got for the season, so let's just make it happen, and then we'll look at the offseason to figure everything else out. Or they're like, we need to make a move right now so we can go win a championship or we can squeeze into this last playoff spot. But when you have teams that are way back at 50% of their season done and they still have half their season left, they're like, well, do I need to make a move yet? Maybe not. This could still work because we have time to – it throws everything off. If everybody's at the same point, everybody is looking at their team in the same way, looking at the season in the same way, and then it sets in a sense of urgency for some teams, right? Uh, looking at the standings right now, if this was exactly like the halfway point, I'll tell you right now, Panther City, Buffalo, Calgary, Saskatchewan, and New York are all looking to make possible trades right now because they're all on the cusp of being in the playoffs versus not. But then you look at, like, the top. San Diego, Albany, and Toronto, and I'll throw Halifax in there as well, are probably looking at, okay, how does our roster really look? Maybe we need to make a move for this one piece that would put us over the top or that would put us over these two teams and have us in a battle with this team. But now teams are like, eh, I can probably wait it out because, yeah, I'm 7-5, and five, but 
this team that still has so many games left to play is only four and seven. So what's the big deal? They're not in a rush. I'm not in a rush. It it throws off the urgency or the need to trade because your season's almost over. Yeah, I, I'd even throw a couple more teams into the mix that you mentioned of like, we got to make a move to make our playoff push that much deeper. You look at page two of the standings. I think you can throw Saskatchewan in there at four and five. New York at five and seven. Philly and Rochester both at four and six. I think those wins for Rochester and Philly last week really solidified like, okay, we have a shot. What do we have to do to get better? What I think they're going to do, Philadelphia-wise, with the trade deadline approaching, and I know they have Nick Rowlett on the team, but one thing I know Paul Day has talked about is just the concern the team has because Nick has never played NLL until this year is his ability to get back on defense, be able to not get stuck back there. So that's why you see a lot of mixing up uh, between Isaiah Davis Allen and Nick Rowlett still at the faceoff stripe. I've seen a lot of talk of Tyrell Hammer Jackson potentially being a trade candidate from Vancouver with them being at three and eight. And now that Connor Farrell has signed a two-year deal with the Buffalo Bandits, it would not surprise me in the slightest if Paul Day tries to pick up the phone, call Vancouver, who the Wings have a trade history with, obviously with Mitch Jones, and say, hey, what's it going to take to get Tyrell Hammer Jackson on this team? That way you have two legitimate face-off guys with Tyrell and with Nick that you can pick and choose when you want to use them, and then you can supplement using Isaiah Davis Allen in more of a transition role rather than having him take face-offs. Yeah, but how many face-offs is he taking a game? More than he should be. And I'm not saying he's bad at them. I think it's just taking away better usage of his skill sets. But then you take if you add another faceoff guy, you're taking away another field player position. Like you'd probably put Nick back on the practice roster. I'm saying you pick and choose like when like what game you want to use Tyrell Hammer Jackson versus Nick. I just I don't know what the thinking would be, but I've seen a lot of people talking about potentially before the Connor Farrell signing it was like could Buffalo or Philly call Vancouver for Tyrell Hammer Jackson. I would have saw Buffalo doing it more than Philly. I see Philly kind of waiting it out and letting Nick come into his own. Um, because like this was kind of a talk with Toronto too when TD first got there because his first year wasn't like great and people were like, Oh, is TD going to be able to figure it out in the NLL? Like, you know, it's different cadence, different type of face off, different game. And I think Philly's kind of taking the same mindset and route that Toronto took and was like, this dude's good. He's fine. He knows the skills. He has them. He knows the game. He knows how to do it. He just has to settle in to the way of the NLL versus the PLL. Um, so I, I could see Philly doing it and possibly working around with some things, but the way it shook out is kind of how it would have expected it to be. The only team I really saw between those two pushing out for, for THJ was Buffalo because they legitimately need one. Mm -hmm. uh, the funniest thing I saw about that whole thing was Ian got fired. replying to the tweet and goes, did I get fired? And I was like, oh, yeah, you did, buddy. <laughs> but I, I fired on his day off. He's just going to move back to his defense slash transition role and, mm -hmm. and do his thing there, which is going to be better for Buffalo anyway because that's more standard and like traditional for him, and he's going to be comfortable there. Um, and Connor Farrell's a great face-off guy. So yeah, I like the moves made there. And I think Connor Farrell was built to play in Buffalo. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I just think people in Philly and, and around the NLL should give Nick a little bit of time. I agree. I, I completely I think Nick is more than capable of playing the box game. Um, it's just a matter of him getting used to the nuances more than anything, because he can win faceoffs for you and get you possessions, which is what the NLL is becoming. And that has become a hot topic that I think like two months ago, you and I talked about when face-offs were becoming a thing. And then, uh, you know, we were watching teams who had the elite face-off guys winning at the stripe. And it's like, 
you see the teams who are at the top of the standings, especially right now, Toronto, Albany, San Diego, Halifax. What do those four teams have in common, Deej? Oh, that's right. They have the top four face-off guys on the planet on their rosters. TD in Toronto, Joe Nardella in Albany, Trevor Baptiste in San Diego, and Jake Withers, who's having an MVP caliber season, is in Halifax. And those are your top four teams in the NLL right now. Face-offs matter in the NLL in this current phase of how the NLL is going. Face-offs matter in every... Agreed. Every stature of lacrosse that is not sixes. 100% agree. But it's becoming more and more like revealing, I think, to NLL fans who I think have been super sticklers in not needing a true like specialist because well, you've seen the Jeremy Thompsons who are phenomenal. You've seen the Jay Thornberts who are not your traditional field face-off guys taking face-offs and winning thousands of face-offs in their careers. But now you're seeing these top four guys doing what they're doing. You see Buffalo go and sign Connor Farrell to a multi-year deal. You see the Wings go and get Nick Rowlett. It's becoming more and more obvious that if you don't, and I mean, even Calgary to a, a degree, like Justin Inacio is having a, a pretty solid year for the Roughnecks. You need a face-off guy in this league. And even Joe Post is having a very solid year for for Rochester. That's hard to say. That's hard to say because, yes, but then you look at... Who has Jeremy Thompson? Right, but like... he's He's like the... Their team is more built around. That's also 2730 mark for the old SpongeBob noise. <laughs> I just don't know like how to put it. Like even Panther City, like there's just teams who understand like we have to just take advantage of when we have the ball. Let's get like when we get a stop, we have to score that next time down. If we can force a turnover here, let's do it. Like they're got, they there's teams that play that way where they're like we understand we don't have a face off guy so let's make the most of every opportunity and that works too and i think that's where a lot of nll fans are hung up is it's not as much of a make and make it take it like it can be in field mm -hmm. because of all the open space in field it seems a little more like if you have a trevor baptiste against someone who's not as skilled you can rattle him off like that versus in box you can have that guy and he can win every face off but you still have to go out there and work for 20 seconds 25 seconds to get a good shot to score not saying you don't have to work in field but the make it take it back to back to back to back to back goals don't happen as often in box as they do in field and i think mm -hmm. that is where a lot of fans go why do we need a specialist when he's not on the floor that often he doesn't necessarily have great defensive skills. He doesn't necessarily have great offensive skills. And if we can just get a turnover or we can create a couple stops here and score on the other end, that negates that factor anyway. And I think that is where the fuse is starting to be. And a lot of fans are now starting to see, okay, we can have that guy that at least has the defensive skills so that if he gets stuck, he can play D. But if he's also able to win us a bunch of faceoffs, we're not playing as much defense. And if we're scoring on those, we're even better than we were before. So I think it's still fusing into my into minds, but it's going to take some time because there are still teams out there where they don't necessarily need a faceoff guy. Yeah, and I mean the the four guys we talked about too that are on the top four teams in the league, um, they're unicorns in this whole situation where they can take an elite face off and like Nards, like Trevor, like Jake Withers can either get back on defense or win a face off and run down the floor and go score. TD will drop back on defense and not be stuck. And on the rare occasion, TD will go and score. Those are like the anomalies there. 
But also when you look at a Jeremy Thompson, who is a face-off specialist in the NLL game, in the box game, when you look at Justin Inacio, who has played the field game before with the Archers in the PLL, uh, wouldn't shock me if he gets an opportunity with the new uh, PLL face-off rules to crack a roster going into training camp in the PLL again because uh, he hit that 30% threshold to be a free agent. Um, you look at, you know, Connor Farrell now getting an opportunity. You look at last year with Max Adler on Buffalo. You look at um, Nick Rowlett. You look at Jay Thornberry, Joe Post. Like, those guys are winning possessions for you for teams that have elite offenses. And that's the thing with the NLL game is it's the 30-second shot clock is obviously – a, a big thing but when you have teams in the NLL as stacked as they are offensively across the board you need somebody who's going to win you possessions to get the ball to those offenses and if you're not doing that you're seeing teams like Vancouver you're seeing a team like Colorado right now who's been to back-to-back -back NLL championships and won two years ago you're seeing those teams struggle because they're not winning possessions they don't have the ability to win at the faceoff stripe and get the ball to their offenses, and the teams they're playing are running down the floor and posting up shop on them. They're scoring in high numbers. Like, Vancouver's 11 games into their season. They just got win number three. Colorado is four and eight. I think it's a, it's a weird difference, but there is a difference, I think, with – looking at Colorado and Vancouver at their current states versus Rochester and Philadelphia at their current states. Even though Philly and Rochester are four and six, I think almost anyone you would say those two teams have a better shot to make the playoffs than Colorado, Vancouver do. I mean, yeah, that's not a question. That, that, and a lot of that has to do with, they have guys who can get them active possessions where Colorado, Vancouver, and to a degree, Las Vegas, they're not getting the active possessions, and that's why they're only scoring in the single digits a bunch of a bunch of these weeks. Well, Vancouver just has other problems, and that to me, too. that that comes down to them. Uh, that comes down to them that more of changing, right? They they got a new coach in, new players are in, they're setting the the new foundation and everything. So I kind of excuse, not necessarily excuse, but it. There's a legitimate reason as to why Vancouver is struggling. Colorado is simply just, I don't even think it's a possession thing. When they get the ball, they're not doing anything with it. Everybody stands around, watches, not a lot of movement, and they're not helping Dylan Ward defensively. They're getting, every team is posting up for whatever shot they want. Mm -hmm. so they, they, I also think they have other problems outside of faceoff. Um, but Vegas is the one team you mentioned that I feel if they had a faceoff guy, they could truly benefit from that because it is a matter of them just not getting enough possessions. And then when you're not getting possessions, if you're not making every single one count, it starts to really show. And I think that's where Vegas is, is a point where, I mean, it's hard to make every possession count in any game, whether no matter what sport you're playing, but especially in lacrosse. So they already have that. And then they're not getting the ball as much as they would like, which adds another layer. So Vegas should really look at going to get a face-off guy but to me, Vancouver and Colorado have much bigger things to work on before they address that issue. But that can be slid in amongst their issues. Yeah. Um, so the standings after week 14 look a little some, some, some like this. Toronto still at the top at 10 and 2. Albany right behind them at 9 and 2. San Diego is 8 and 4. Halifax is 7 and 5. Redacted is 7 and 6. Panther City is five and six. Buffalo is five and six. Calgary is five and six. Saskatchewan is four and five. New York is five and seven. Philadelphia and Rochester are, are both four and six. Las Vegas is four and seven. Colorado is four and eight. And Vancouver is three and eight. And a lot can change this week, Deej, because going into week 15, I'm pretty sure. Almost every team or every team is active once again uh, as we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have eight games this week. Double headers include Albany is playing twice. 
And I believe that's it. So one team is on a bye. And I will figure it out as soon as I can. Because uh, it's hard to look at these logos and figure it out on the fly. <laughs> but the schedule, we got three games on Friday. Vancouver at Albany. Calgary at Redacted. Saskatchewan at Buffalo. Uh, and then Saturday, we kick things off. We got an early Saturday game, Teach. Early Saturday. And by early, I'm not talking like matinee. I'm talking we got a 5 p.m. Eastern time start on Saturday. Colorado at Toronto. A what p.m. Eastern time? 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. What else is happening in Toronto for them to be doing that? Nice little dinner time. <laughs> I don't know why it's that. My head hurts for trying to figure that out. And let me and let, and let me guess, Halifax is 6 p.m. On, on Friday. No, because Halifax is on the West Coast, so it's a 10 p.m. start in San Diego. Oh, that's so much better. That's so <laughs> much better. But before that kicks off, we also have 7 p.m. on Saturday, Albany at Rochester, 7.30, Las Vegas at New York, Halifax at San Diego at 10 p.m. on Saturday, and then Sunday, 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 3 p.m. Sunday afternoon lacrosse, which I will be in attendance for. It's Panther City at Philadelphia. How are we feeling about week 15, Deej? Um, Friday is painful because Albany is most likely going to blow the doors off of Vancouver. I have to watch my two teams battle each other. And I don't really know which one's going to win. <laughs> uh, Halifax, San Diego will be game of the week. Um, I think Albany Rochester will be good since all or Albany's playing back to backs. Granted, they're not traveling like anywhere, but I, I still think that's going to be huge. Um, and surprisingly, it's it's going to be very fun to watch TK come back to Philadelphia again. So I, I like this weekend, man. There's some good games. Um, obviously, uh, slept slept on game of the week is Friday at seven thirty. That's Saskatchewan Buffalo game. I think will be slept on. We've talked about not choosing against Saskatchewan again due to their current circumstance and how they're undefeated with the bench scenario. How did we do that on. last week? Why <laughs> did we do that? We Brilliant. talked about it right after we picked. We're we so were like, stupid. we couldn't do this, but we're going to anyway. So, yeah, that's, that's something to look at, man. Buffalo is trying to maintain this even keeled season they've had they've literally been average like 500 basically all year so they're just trying to keep that going which i don't know what is happening up there uh might have a lot to do with the signing of connor farrow and the lack of having a true face-off guy there to help um but yeah also just dumb every team is playing this week it's just albany plays twice good job odd number of teams in the league i wouldn't go hard I wasn't going to call you dumb because math is, in fact, hard. Um, but, yeah, that's that's the biggest thing is there. there's some good games this weekend, but Halifax, San Diego will most likely be game of the week. I think that's going to be a great game. I think I agree with you on Saskatchewan and Buffalo. Um, I also think Albany-Rochester is going to be awesome. Like, those two teams can score. They can face off. Joe Post and, and Joe Nardella know each other very well. Um, I think that game is going to be electric on Saturday. I also think Philly and Panther City, it's always a close game, and it's going to come down to can Philly keep up with Panther City's pace um, because they all, Panther City is just – they always got the zoomies, and Philly's got to be able to score more than 11 goals in a game uh, to win that because Panther City has the the snipers from the outside, whether it's the Malcolm brothers, Callum Crawford, whoever it may be, they got to be able to score uh, to win that game on Sunday and, and keep their playoff hopes alive. Uh, plus, I want to see more guys wearing the luchador mask. 
that's the the wings winning uh thing in the locker room is they have a luchador mask that they put on chad tutton put it on this week uh after they beat calgary put it on shook his head and was like somebody give me a pint <laughs> no words it's absolutely electric um i also hope calgary wipes the floor with redacted simply because they still have not followed us I'm not going to feed into the meth you're trying to throw at me. <laughs> you don't want I, the team to I, win? I, I, bro, how am I supposed to pick? Bro, it's of your team. I want my, of course I want my team to win. But the hard part about this season is they're playing the other one of my teams. And the, sure. other, one of my, the other one of my teams has been better than my team. That's why this game sucks. Because do I go with who's hot and playing well this year, or do I go with my heart? You know what? Your team always comes first. There's something about me that is uberly loyal. <laughs> Roughnecks by a billion. There we go. There we go. Um, I also I think the fascinating part of this week, too, is Albany just playing twice, and not that the travel is far to go from Albany to Rochester, per se. Um but having multiple games is going to be interesting to watch them uh, perform on a back-to-back uh, against Vancouver and Rochester, who Vancouver is a team they should beat, and Rochester is a team that's going to give them their best shot. Um, but I'm looking forward to this week. I think it's going to be a, a great week of NLL action. Uh, so without any further ado, Deej, let's head on over to the Pick Pond. And feed some ducks and bring the people the NLL Week 15 Beer Money Picks of the Week, powered by Kenwood Beer, the official beer partner of Underground Sports Philadelphia and the Outside the Box podcast. It's in a refreshing light beer, just 4.1% ABB, only 120 calories, just 8 grams of carbs, and part of our official live tailgate podcast series that we're doing all baseball season long with underground sports philadelphia our main show uh that will be going down before phillies games this year kenwood beer will be a part of that go to kenwoodbeer.com and use the kenny finder to see who's got kenwood beer on tap in the philadelphia pittsburgh maryland and new jersey areas you can also get it at your local liquor store in those markets and check out the Kenny storefront. We got the Kelly Green uh, crew necks and shirts. St. Patty's Day, just 10 days away as we're recording this. Gear up. Got to be 21 or older to do so. And, of course, please drink responsibly. Deej, we start off in Albany as the Firewolves host Vancouver. I believe it is their Indigenous Heritage Night Um on Friday night, so they have a, a new profile picture, which looks absolutely awesome. I'm sure the jerseys are going to be absolutely amazing. Uh, but I got to go with the home team here. I love the way Albany's playing right now. They're playing with good pace. Joe Nardella's on fire this year. And uh, I love everything I've seen from Albany. And it is you know, fun to look down the line and realize that next season, this team's also going to have Dyson Williams on it. Yeah, I know. That team's going to be scary next year. <laughs> um, but it, this one's pretty easy for me. Uh, I think Albany's got it. Like I said, I love, love, love Kurt, McC uh, Kurt Miloski. Obviously everything he did in, in Calgary was amazing. He's got pieces up there that he's trying to work with and put together, but this year's just not the year. Albany's been great, um, at doing some things. And one of those things is scoring. And one of those other things is not letting teams score more than them which means they're winning a lot of games. They're 9-2, and two, and I think they start the weekend picking up a, a win and going 10-2 and two before playing again. Uh, which then brings us to 7.30 p.m. Eastern time on Friday. As Deej put it so eloquently, we're both on the same page. Roughnecks by a Billy. Give us the Roughnecks to get a big dub over Redacted. As much... Ah, I may not make this pick yet. Don't look at me like that, bro. Don't look at me like that, bro. Because listen, I love my roughnecks. 
I really do. But we're also competing for something that I've been holding on to for two years straight. And sure, kind of you've, you've gotten the best of me for a while. I'm I have to go back and do some math this week, but you've got a substantial lead on me. I have not been good in my picks this year. I ain't been I haven't been my normal self either. So that that's that's why this is such a big deal. Because normally I wouldn't think twice, pick my rough necks and go on with the day. But there's six other games to pick this week, Teej. What you trying to listen, bro? Every game matters. You know this. I I can't do it. Give me the rough next. There we go. Atta boy. Uh, are we on the same page for 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, Deej? Saskatchewan at Buffalo. I don't know if this will be Connor Farrell's debut or not uh, because we typically don't find out when guys are playing until day of. Um, but Bandits are at home. They're 5-6. and six. Playing very Jekyll and Hyde this season. I need to are we on the same page? What, what page are you on? That's the thing. I'm still looking at the pages like Arthur reading the book meme and his eyes are like going both ways. Hey, you know what I say. Trends, they matter. Pay attention to them. There's one team that's got a real trend going on between these two. We ignored it last week. I'm not ignoring it again. When did when did uh, Keenan get on the bench for Saskatchewan? A couple games ago. I think this is game two. Or this this week will be game three that he's on the bench. I believe. So he's been there. Was it before the new year? I don't believe so. I think the only game he's lost on the bench was the Halifax game a couple weeks ago. So they only had one loss. Yeah, give me Saskatchewan. Uh, hey, I'm rolling with him. Give me the rushies. Uh, the next game on the docket is on Saturday. I think we're both on the same page with this one as well, simply because one team is the best team in the league and they're at home. The other team looks completely lost. 5 p.m. Eastern time, Toronto hosting Colorado. I'm taking the Toronto Rock. You know I got the Rock. Like, at this point, they're like my proximity team. They're literally the closest to me. So I, I kind of just have attached to them in some kind of way. But I do still have a serious beef with them as a Calgary Roughnecks fan. So don't get they that. They also mistaken. don't follow us. Don't get that mistaken. But yeah, the, the Rock are crazy good this year. And um, only a couple teams have stopped them. But I don't even think they really stopped them. I think they just managed to score one more goal than they did, uh, which changes a lot. I got the Rock as well. Then we move to 7 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday. Albany at Rochester. Rochester coming off a 19-goal performance on the road against Panther City. Albany, this is the back end of their doubleheader. They're on the road for this one. Rochester looking to keep their postseason hopes alive. Heading into the trade deadline. How do you see the battle of uh, upstate New York going down, Deach? Oh, I know they're playing back to back, but we've been talking about it all day. Face off. Bernardella is arguably the best in the league. They're not doing too much traveling because they're at home Friday and then they're going just to Rochester. On Saturday, I don't even—I don't even think they're flying. They're probably just going to take a bus. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think they can get it done back to back. Give me two and zero Albany on the weekend. They got to keep pace with Toronto. I'm with you. I think this game is going to be very close, though. Um, would it shock me if Rochester pulls an upset? Absolutely not. Um, I think this is going to be like a one goal game at the end of the day. 
but I'm going to go with Albany as well, which then moves us to 7.30 Eastern time on Saturday. Vegas at New York. Both teams looking to stay alive in the playoff hunt. I'm going to go with New York here. Um, Jeff T being one of the main reasons. New York's at home. Vegas has to come across some time zones. I'm going to go with New York to get a, a close win at home. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Las Vegas hasn't been making the most of every possession that they've been getting, which is a big thing when you don't have a face-off guy. I think that extends in one team that has been pretty solid at putting the ball in the back of the net this year has been New York. Um, a, a lot of their losses have come from them not being able to get a stop on the defensive end rather than not being able to score. So I think that plays a huge factor into this game and, and the Riptide are going to come out on top. Which then brings us to the nightcap on Saturday. Halifax at San Diego. The official OTB game of the week? Question mark? Definitely game of the week. Home field advantage matters. This face-off battle is going to be crazy. But ironically, I trust the San Diego offense just a little bit more. And I think Austin comes out on top in the battle of the stocks. San Diego's at home. And I like this for them a lot. This game is going to be determined at the stripe. I love the, the face-off battle in this one between Trevor and Jake Withers. They, they still have some recency bias for doing the damn thing. I'm going to take San Diego. Get the dub. Move to the final game of the weekend, Deej. Panther City at Philly, 3 p.m. Sunday, 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 Sunday. You already know where I'm going. Wings are getting a big-time home dub, looking to build off of last Saturday's first home win of the season. Give me the wings. Oh, yeah, I like the wings here as well. I like the wings here as well. The, uh, Panther City has been good. And they've been battling and making some things seriously happen uh, the last couple of weeks, but they're they've been sliding five and it's six. It's a big tiebreaker game. Five and six. And I'm gonna be honest, I'm really choosing them to lose because I need them to so that my roughnecks can get a better chance and move up in these polls or in these standings and unified. Um, because right now my roughnecks slide into the playoffs to play the number one seed at Toronto Rock. I don't want that round one. I don't. I'm cool with playing them. I'm cool with being the ones to possibly take them down. But I don't want to do a round one. And a great opportunity for that is for the Panther City lacrosse club to lose this weekend so my Roughnecks can win and we can make a jump. Also, wouldn't mind Buffalo losing. Woo! If my picks are right, my Roughnecks move up to fifth? Or six, six, sorry. But still, I'll take it. That's much better than eight. Now, here's the thing, Deej, as you were talking early in our pick segment here, as I haven't even, I don't know why I took the banner down. Um, you were contemplating with your team versus your league pass team. Right now, as it stands, pick segment's still going on. We have the same picks this week. which usually goes one of two ways. <laughs> and, and it's the latter of two ways most times. Yes. <laughs> you want to change something? I'm contemplating changing something. I'm solid right where I'm at. I did all my think pieces already. I'm good.
I'm going to go against the grain. I'm going with the home team to get a dub. Give me Buffalo. Good job. Give me Buffalo to get the win. You just solidified that you're not beating me in picks. <laughs> Give me Buffalo. We'll see how that pays off for me. I like that. Good job. You'll get a live video reaction one way or another. I'll go Stephen A. Smith mode after the Cowboys lose all the time. <laughs> uh, so there it is. Our NLL Week 15 Beer Money Picks of the Week. We both have Albany and Calgary. I'm going Buffalo. Deej has Saskatchewan. And then we both have Toronto, Albany, New York, San Diego, and Philadelphia. And those are your NLL Week 15 Beer Money Picks of the Week. Brought to you by Kenwood Beer. Deej, let's shift gears to uh, PLL Free Agency. But before we do, we have an awesome interview from Champs. Here's our final interview with Brendan Coleman, BC. The, the brain behind the PLL app. And it is brought to you by the PLL app and our PLL app code. Download the PLL app. DJ and I use the PLL app religiously. If you listen to the show, you know we're always looking at the app. Deej will blow up my phone with seven text messages and I'm thinking something is wrong. No, it's him trying to get an achievement to get 500 XP. Uh, by sharing articles or videos and I have a mini heart attack, but then I have to realize that's what it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My bad. I, I see it and I'd be like, who would even care? Maybe. <laughs> so I'm like, is, does DJ have sources? What's happening? No, nah. <laughs> it's, it's, no. it's articles. It's articles. I'm just reminding you to get on there and get your XP. Get your XP, <laughs> and you can get 500 XP through OTB when you download the PLL app, go to the redeem code section, and use code OTBPOD. That's OTB pod for 500 XP in the PLL app. Our good pal Patty Pitts used it a couple weeks ago, and he instantly leveled up from level one to level two. Instant level up. So if you haven't downloaded it already, download the PLL app. And if you have downloaded it already, you can still use our code. Go to the redeem code section and use code OTB pod for 500 XP in the PLL app. Now, here is the brains behind the PLL app, who he gives a nice little hat tip to each to the Discord users, the one and only. Brandon Coltman. What's going on, OTB Nation? We are back with another day of OTB Radio, joined by the man, the myth, the legend behind PLL Nation, my man BC. How's it going, man? Oh, it's going great. Happy to be here. We have a ton of stuff going on with PLL Nation here at Champ Series. Take me through just the process of preparing for an event like this and integrating everything that's going on with the app and PLL Nation for everybody that's here on site and everybody at home. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the big thing in the premise of PLL Nation is we have a ton of really, really passionate fans, and we wanted to figure out a way to really reward them for their loyalty and their commitment year over year. So, um, you know, that's how PLL Nation started, and and really, what what the goal is is that you know, it it's not just about how much you spend, but that only covers only part of what it means to be a fan. So, we want to make sure that we we capitalize on anything from your performance and fantasy to, you know, attending games is a huge one to even, you know, how, how much you actually try to grow the game and, and spread the word as well. So we're really trying to, to make sure that we're like really rewarding those that are going throughout and help and spread the game. Cause that's where it's going to come from. It's going to come from the fans. You know, I was talking to Mike Rabel on Wednesday and he said, you know, to try and make this app as smooth and seamless as it can be, because so many people do have, app fatigue it's like what makes this app stand out so much and i think fans at home and myself and dj in particular using it to prep for the pod like there's so much value that you get out of the app from like you said fantasy to having every team's roster readily available for you to live updates on scores what goes into just making sure that the app has everything that a fan needs well, I think I'll give a shout out to uh, the Discord crew too, because they've been they've been super helpful, and those 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 uh, 
the, those fans in there are legends. And so what we really did from the start was we, we just talked to all the fans and understand it a lot about, hey, what, what do you want to see? What, uh, what like, really defines you as a fan and what do you need to see in the, in the app? And so, you know, that was step one. And then we continued even still now, we continue to try to understand more and more what fan wants. And what we've kind of see is it, it's really different. It's different when you talk to different fans. So that's where kind of that personalization side of, of the app comes in where, you know, you can tell us exactly what you're looking for and, and we'll try to make, make sure that you get the right content to you at the right time. You know, this past season, you guys were the first app and first league ever to have, like, digital integration into a broadcast. I just got the notification on the app now. We're doing it again today on Sunday. What goes into that process, kind of working alongside with an ESPN to make sure that that goes smooth and is able to be readily available for the fans watching at home, too? Yeah, I mean, when we came to ESPN with that, they got it immediately, and they were like, oh, that's a great idea, absolutely. And so we kind of... You know, we're like, all right, how do we how do we figure out how to give fans credit for watching in real time? Uh, and so we, we we brought up to ESPN this idea of getting the, the code on. And, and, you know, the technology that goes into it is really interesting. Um, but, you know, it's it's done really well. I've seen a lot of the, the talks on uh, across social and on Discord and all that. People are really excited about, oh, did you see the code there? So, um, yeah, again, it's 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 a, it's all about just giving fans credit for supporting the league and, and growing the game. So that was just another level of what we, we tried to experiment with. What went into just the development of the XP model and getting people kind of into the app? Was that kind of the premise? It was like, hey, we're going to reward you for just coming into the app every day. And it kind of just evolved from there. Yeah, I, I like to say kind of we, we call it gamification. But that idea like XP of like, hey, doing things to earn. It's a, it's a pretty universal language. And so we kind of wanted to find something that, that fans understood. Um, but, you know, it, it needs to have some way to actually track your, your progress. So from when you're a brand new fan to, you know, one of those MVPs that have some really cool rewards. Like, you know, we, we gave MVPs a year of, of ESPN Plus on us. Tickets, they can get all that stuff. It's just rewarding them, uh, you know, based on, you know, how much time they're committing. Because we know you can spend time elsewhere. And so we're really, really, um, you know, excited that you're spending it with us and we want to reward you for it. And I think the cool part, too, that, you know, this past season, if you're on location, it's kind of like a scavenger hunt. And you go and find that QR code in the Premier Zone and you're able to get a ton of XP just for being at a live event. I think that whole process of, like, the on-site gamification, like you said, is such a cool feature. Yeah, well, you know, we, we know that if you actually go to a game, right, like uh, the atmosphere here, if you bring friends to the games too, like they become fans for life. Um, and so we, again, want to just reward you for coming to the game, going throughout, really experiencing and, and kind of using those those different codes that you can scan it all out as a way to really walk you through the event so that you can get to all the best activations and, and have the best time you can. We were talking earlier this week about the, the fantasy component. and I think the PLL fantasy is such a unique approach to fantasy sports where you kind of combine the fans that want to put the GM hat on and you're using a salary cap while also trying to fit the best players into the small roster space that you have. What kind of was the, the model of your guys' development of fantasy for the PLL? Yeah, so we so we looked a lot about fantasy early on, and and uh, one thing we want to do make sure you know you have those times where you draft a team and you just get the bad, bad luck or or you know player gets hurt all that stuff. We wanted uh, week over week because of the PLL changes so much. We wanted to have people be able to go in. There's a lot more levels of strategy in this. Like it was it was really cool to see some people were talking about oh like you got to have like a really good player and then, you know, save those coins for, for another one. Others are like, here's the different strategy. So there's so many different strategies. Um, and I, you know, I think that as, as the fantasy culture in lacrosse evolves, fantasy's huge in other sports, uh, we're going to see some really interesting strategy come out. And, uh, you know, we've just seen the, the culture of fantasy and lacrosse grow like crazy. And I somehow got the best of everybody. I got Matt DeLuca on my fantasy oh, team this week. You're so set. You're I'm set. set at the goalie position for sure. Um, what are some things that fans can look forward to this coming year with the app? I'm sure, you know, every week it feels like something new is coming and it's a, an improvement on the app. I think one of the subtle improvements I've noticed is just the banner notification you get if you haven't logged in for the day. Hey, you're about to lose streak at your XP. 
what are some things that could be coming down the pipeline that fans should be excited about with the app? Yeah, absolutely. And we're always trying to look at like different ways that fans can engage during the game um, and e even kind of, you know, do some some cross. We know that, you know, college across is huge with our fans. So we introduced with the, with uh, the help from from TLN introduced like college pick them and and college predictor. So like really just trying to just find more and more ways to to engage during games and have like, you know, fun ways to bond with your kids or like, you know, banter with your friends. So that's a big one. I think the the next you know, big theme we're looking for is around, you know, building out communities around around the teams, especially now that we're local. Um, so, you know, there's there's things in the pipeline, like being able to chat and message uh, others and fans to really like build so that, you know, if you're a fan of, of the Archers, like you can come in here and talk talk game with with other Archers fans, like minded fans. Who is the genius behind the daily trivia? Because some of those questions I'm like, OK, I got this. And then other days I'm like, who spent the meticulous time of co conjuring up some of these questions? Oh yeah, yeah. The the people that put together sometimes they're a little bit deviant. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been caught on some trick questions. They're they're really good. Uh, but yeah, we like to we like to kind of ask a lot of people from from the the POL. Um, some people come up with really 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 difficult uh, questions. Some come up with with ones that trick you. I've been tricked plenty of times for sure. Absolutely, and I mean it, it's just so fun to have so many different avenues in the app that you can kind of travel to each and every day from the trivia to fantasy, uh, keeping up with games, following your favorite players and team. I think the app has revolutionized what every sports league should be looking to have from an app for their league. Uh, and I think it's only going to get better. And you guys hooked us up this week in the app too. Uh, make sure you redeem code OTB pod in the app and you get 500 XP in the app that's that's a lot of xp you don't want to miss out on that one uh so use code otb pod in the pll app download that app support the pll support us and uh bc thanks for hopping on man. thanks this is a pleasure shout out to bc for hopping on the show uh also this is extremely hilarious if this is no there's no way that's yeah, okay. I was gonna say somebody quote tweeted the uh the Steph Curry picture that's going crazy on Twitter and said, I was just trying to enjoy the game. I did not think I'd end up on camera, and then everyone in the comment section is like, Not you, not you, not you, not you. <laughs> it is not that person. Very funny picture though. Shout out Steph Curry. Um but shout out to BC for hopping on the show, giving us a little peek behind the curtain with the PLL app and what's to come. Uh, PLL free agency, though, Deej, has been absolutely insane. At the top of the show, we obviously had our, our breaking news there with Jack Kelly re-signing with the Redwoods and Blaze Reardon signing his extension with Chaos. We have some free agency news of our own. The boys are official homecoming pass holders for the Philadelphia Water Dogs. Bang, bang. Chicken wing. Deta more details to come on all of that because obviously you guys know Deej and I will be on the sidelines in the press box for Philadelphia weekend. Some other things in the works as well. So we're not going to need to sit in our seats. But some lucky listeners will be. Two people getting some seats. You're going to sit in the official Underground Sports Philadelphia Outside the Box podcast seats in Villanova. The Philly supporter section. Exactly. In the Philadelphia Water Dog supporter section. In the Mikey Sowers row, row 22. It only felt right to do that. Uh, and you'll be amongst the Water Dogs faithful. One of, if not the best supporter group in the PLL. They're doing the damn thing right, and it only felt right to have the podcast seats in the Water Dog supporter section June 15th and 16th. Someone lucky will be sitting in the OTB Underground Sports Philadelphia seats. I'm surprised you didn't do sticks. Well, Deej, there's this thing called price tiers, and... Uh... <laughs> Double sticks was half the price of single sticks. Good. We don't <laughs> like single sticks. 
Double Lee. sticks is fine. Double Lee. sticks is fine. I can't um, like that number that much, man. That is my number, bro. Just, bro. We could do so much better. Chill on me. Let's take a quick 20. We'll be right back. 30. Uh, <laughs> this is 30. The 30 second timeout. Yeah, but 40. we only got time for 20. 60, 30. I need you to learn the game. We only got time for 20 because we got to talk PLL free agency in this bitch. <laughs> uh, we have had some big time signings, a lot of movement since we last recorded. Um, big shout out to the homie Chase, the PLL pipeline uh, for keeping it a buck and keeping everyone up to date on PLL free agency. Some of the moves that have been made since we last recorded, Deej. Have we talked about any of them, really? I, I don't know. I don't think we have. No, we have not. Um, so, since PLL free agency has opened, this is what has happened. As of about a week ago, removed from the pup list and added to the 25-man roster for your Maryland Whip Snakes, Joe Nardella back on the roster. Along with that, John Robbins activated from the pup list for the Archers. Jack Trainer activated from the pup list to the 25-man roster for the Water Dogs after his brilliant performance in the Champ Series. The Denver Outlaws activated Mike Messenger from the pup list to the 25-man roster. Chaos re-signed LSM Ryan McNulty through 2024. And then the big stuff started going off a couple days ago when True Free Agency opened. Tim Troutner signed a one-year deal through 2024 with the New York Atlas, according to our good friend Chris Rosenthal. And since, obviously... Uh, confirmed by the team. That was the first domino of free agency. It was Big Timmy T moving on from the Redwoods to the Atlas, Deej. And honestly, I like this for Tim. I think this is a good move. He's going to get a chance to play. He's going to be alongside our guy, Drake Porter. And I think it's a better situation for him in terms of playing time and in terms of just kind of getting back on track to what he was in 2019 and in parts of 2020. Uh, I think he's fine. <laughs> like uh, we see it, it, it clears day with Albany, and I think he's just gonna come back and make uh the whip stakes stronger. Uh, they they obviously was a weak point of their team last year, but they also were dealing with other wing and face off group injuries, which extended. To the, I'm not even talking about the right person, am I? I'm talking about Timmy T, bro. <laughs> I don't know you why said, you so said locked. Albany, and I was like, huh? I don't know why I'm so locked in on Joe Nardella. <laughs> I mean, he's a friend but of the program. I, 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 as somebody who ragged on Timmy for cert certain parts of his game, I, I truly do hope that he gets a solid chance to go over to the Atlas and be a helping piece in some kind of way. It may not even be directly on the field right away. Whatever role it is, I hope that he does it to, to the fullest extent and does well. But if he does get back on the field, I hope that he plays absolutely lights out against everybody but the Redwoods. Um, and, and that's just me being a Redwoods fan and wanting them to continue to dominate Atlas like they have been for the past couple of years. Um, but seriously, I, I do hope he's able to figure things out, i.e. mainly his five hole. Um, Is he an upgrade I'm, over Jack Kincannon in your opinion? No, but I think they're like even because Jack's really good up close and, and his five holes good, but he's that goalie where you give up the shots you want to give up and he doesn't save them. Mm -hmm. Then you look at Jack or you look at Timmy, you give up those, those long shots from 12, 15, 17. He's going to save those mm -hmm. and he's pretty decent inside up close, but his five hole is atrocious. 
So like you, you, you got two goods, one bad with both of them. So I don't think you're really giving up or, or sacrificing anything with either one. It's just a matter of, do you want to be able to play a game where you can force out wide shots and have Timmy save them? Or do you want to continue playing the way you have and kind of have a, Hey, whatever you do, force a contested shot or just let them go right by you. Cause Jack's going to save it on crease. It's I also think Atlas, I also think Atlas are going to be a team that drafts a goalie. Maybe, maybe not, not first round, obviously, but because, well, well it's going to have to be to me. I think you got to draft first round if you're going goalie, because there's are, there's not a lot of very good goalies. There's good goalies, but there's not a lot of very good goalies that are going to be in this draft class. So if you want one, you got to go early. So I think we're going to see a. I think we see a couple teams draft a goalie first round. I mean, the, the two big ones are Liam Entman and Chase Erland. I don't think they. I don't think either one of them makes it past the first round because What's Redwood, draft order again. Redwoods need a goalie. The Outlaws could use another goalie. Atlas, Atlas could pick one up if they want to. You don't think – why don't they need one? Why Why don't the Outlaws need one? I think they like Scannoni, and that's why they brought him back. And I right. think they're also very high on Owen McElroy. Are they, though? Because we don't really hear him talk about him. He doesn't get any PT, which, like – Goalie's a weird position to get PT, but like we've seen it with every other team that like has a backup goalie. Like, for example, Water Dogs. We know they're not letting go of Matt DeLuca anytime soon because any chance they get to play him, they do. But here's my thing with the Atlas, because here's the draft order I have it. It's Outlaws. We already know who they're drafting. Right. Atlas have number two. Whips have number three. Chaos are four. Woods are five. Cannons are six. Water dogs are seven. Archers are eight. I mean, cannons could go get another one. Well, they. That's three or four teams right there that are possibly looking at a goalie. I'm pretty sure they extended gets through 2024. Here's my thing because you said. About because I think I personally think from sourcing we've done, we kind of have an idea of who the Redwoods want goalie wise. Oh, I know exactly who they want. Exactly. I've had that conversation. Like, I know the, the there are two names on their list, and if I they think they will guys, be they will be afforded the opportunity for their one top of them. choice. Yes. Uh, with Atlas being ahead of them, I don't know. You think Atlas is going to pass on Connor Schellenberger? Maybe. I think that would be a if, generational if, mistake. If they're looking to get another goalie. Yeah. Because but here's here's my thought process. It's like there's two, right? It's Liam and Chase, but everybody wants Liam. Everybody wants like, right. like if you go get a goalie this year, you're looking at Liam Intimate. I could see Atlas going, our offense isn't bad. They didn't have a problem offensively. Jeff Teat led the league in assists. They could score goals. They couldn't stop them. I see Atlas going more at defense and goalie than I see them going at anything else. I do have to check one thing with Atlas. Um, but here's my my thought process with everything. Number one, it's B.O. Schellenberger, two. Whips draft. Um, why am I blanking? Cav. Chaos at four. Andy Towers has his collection of guys that he likes and is going to go get who fits his system. Redwoods draft Liam Entman at five. Cannons at six. I think Brian Holman kind of has a mold of what he wants to do. But I also could see 
Atlas trading into the first round again to go and get Chase. But say they don't trade in. I think worst case scenario, Atlas can still get Chase Ireland at number 10 with their second pick in the draft. Because the Water Dogs are not drafting a goalie. Because they technically have three guys. Dylan Ward, DeLuca, and Jason Rose. Archers have their three guys. Three? Uh, Washuda is behind Dobson. And then, uh, what's his name? That was also on the Champ Series roster. Oh, Birkinshaw? Birkinshaw. And then the Outlaws roll back around. I think the Outlaws also have more pressing options than, or pressing needs than a goalie when they have two guys on the roster that are more than capable of being starting goalies. And then Atlas can go and get Chase at number 10. And those are your two five-star goalie picks in the draft. It's just so early to tell right now. I, I just, I, there's only two of them that are, I won't say worthy of being drafted, but two of them that are like possible draft and play guys right away. And like I like I mentioned earlier, special teams are the important part of this game. Mm-hmm. So I I could see somebody taking the chance early on goalies because of that factor. That's why I say like. We could see them go early because other teams are thinking, like, how long are these goalies sitting? And, like, when it comes to goalie, there's premier talent, and then there's good, and then there's average and, and under. If you want premier talent, you got to go get them. I think that I, I, I do think the Atlas will end up with Chase one way or another. I think that's, I think that's their guy. Chase early. Mm-hmm. He doesn't fit their mold of goalie, though. But do we know their mold of goalie, really? Because their goalies it's have tall. all been inherited outside of signing Tim Troutner right now. It's tall and lanky, unless your name's Drake Porter. And J.D. Colarusso. Right, but those were Rubio guys. Right. We don't really know what Pressler's mold of a goalie is. I mean, he likes Kincannon because he didn't even think about taking him out of a game. Well, he clearly didn't like him enough to re-sign him, and he brought in Tim Troutner instead. <laughs> Who's exactly like Kincannon. They're built the same. They have some of the same mannerisms. They just don't have the same odd points in their game. He likes tall, slender goalies for whatever reason. That's why the Intamin thing scares me is because – why not have Timmy T, but better, as in Liam Entman? But then you're also passing on generational talent. Liam Entman is generational talent. I'm talking offensively. He Connor has, Schellenberger doesn't walk through the door every year. He has generational talent offensively already. Jeff T ain't walking through every door. Right. He's got Jeff T. He's got Chris Gray. He's also got an aging Eric Law. And he also has Xander Dixon. You can just put T to X, move Xander to the wing. You still got Brian Costabile up top. That team doesn't necessarily need offense, but they damn sure could use a good goalie. I'm just saying how I think it's going to play out. I, I I hear you. I'm not I'm not opposed to that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm absolutely definitely opposed to Connor Schellenberger going to the Atlas. I would not like that. Their offense is high powered enough. They don't need. We don't need that. I'm tired of seeing these water dog, archer, whip snake type offenses where there's a thousand people that you got to guard. Somebody go draft a defenseman. Find out who's going to get beat on him. Who, who is he going to, who's he going to beat on all day? Why we, why we always want to go after the offensive talent. Fuck offense. Fuck it. It's stupid. Who wants to get beat on all day and score goals? I don't. I want to do the beating and hit somebody. 
You're one of the few. <laughs> oh no, there's a lot of me out there. This is why we need Brian on the cast. Brian would agree with me so fast. We need Brian. Brian on the pod. Acting act like he's upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> on the pod and now. He, he gets it. He would agree with so many things I'm saying right now, but I'm not opposed to them stacking up offensively. I can see it happening, but I would not be surprised to see them bite early on Chase or Liam. And obviously I'm putting Liam over Chase because Liam's the best goalie in the country right now in college across. But Chase is also winning a lot of games in that Hopkins uniform. So he's standing out as well. And let's not forget, there's a Kirsty coming out this year. There's at least one Cav coming out, if not two. Brendan O'Neill, Colin Schellenberger, uh, Peyton Cormier, Dyson Williams, all coming out this year. I think Colin McAsee is a senior as well for Princeton. I'm pretty sure he's coming out. Like The offense is crazy this year in the draft. They could pass on Connor and still get somebody very good. That fits their scheme offensively. But there's only two goalies they can go and get, in my opinion, that are going to be at that level. It's Chase Earl and it's Liam Entman. I see them both. I see them both going first round. One of them possibly slides to the second. And I think Chase is that was this guy. Uh, but back to free agency, because we aren't even scratching the surface with all the moves that have happened. Uh Moving on from the Redwoods as well and heading down to Carolina, signing a one-year deal through 2024, Jules Henningberg heading to the chaos. Also heading to chaos, former Redwood Sergio Perkovic on a one-year deal through 2024. Also heading to the chaos, former Redwood Kevin Rogers. Are they out of the woods yet, Deej? Are they out of the woods yet? <laughs> now I believe they are. Chaos is gobbling up every former Redwood that they possibly can, except for Romar Dennis. Awesome. Um, chill on me. <laughs> you ain't slick. Uh, your thoughts on the Carolina Redwoods? I purposely did not get into this all week so that I could do it now. I did a little bit of talking with my man Brian yesterday, but Woods fans, do it with me. One big breath. Just breathe and relax. The Redwoods are fine. Mm -hmm. But like I said yesterday, it hurts. Because you do get attached and you do fall in love with seeing certain players in your favorite team's jersey. And you do want them to be successful in your favorite team's jersey. But that does not mean you're entitled to it. And that does not mean it's going to happen. The Redwoods tried with this roster that they've had for a combination of four to five years as different guys have come in and out. And guess what? It hasn't worked outside of year one where they made it to the championship and lost. You know what that means? It's kind of time for change. because. My man's, I want to say it was Albert Einstein, but I might be wrong on that, <laughs> said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing but expecting a different result. So if y'all want to keep being insane, by all means, we can go back and re-sign all them dudes and then go back and have another lackluster season where we barely squeeze into the playoffs and get bounced first round. If that's what you want, fine. But as a Woods fan, that's not what I want. I'm okay with seeing change. Could this season be rough because of it? Yeah. But maybe next season or three, four, five seasons down the line, we're hosting the Premier Lacrosse Cup because we just won the trophy. That beautiful thing that comes from Tiffany and Co. I'm down for it. I don't know if you are. I also Nicole. don't think it's going to be a rough season for the Redwoods. And it may not be. But could it possibly be? Yeah, because sure. we can see exactly what's happening with Vancouver, where new pieces come in, and then it struggles as you set the foundation and get the chemistry and everything going. It could be a one-year spout where it's like that, but it also could not be. But either way, you have to allow change, and 
It's the Plus, turn of the tide. For, for the last two years, we have been on this podcast and we have talked to people and everyone has said the Redwoods need to adapt to what every other team in the league is doing and get younger. And I talked to some people this week and said the Redwoods needed to get younger. And that's what you're seeing. And then everyone loses their minds when they've been when they're doing what you all have been clamoring for in the comment sections of social media for the past two seasons. They're doing what you asked for, and now you're losing your minds. And I'm not just saying this because Nat and Chris Collins are our guys. I'm saying this from a totally objective point of view. The Redwoods are doing what needed to be done, and I genuinely like what they're doing. I think that team, watching what they were at Champ Series and watching what they are going to evolve into with some of these signings, I love what they are doing in free agency so far. We will get to some of the moves that they made in terms of more re-signings and some other guys coming into the fold. But if I'm a Redwoods fan, which obviously you guys know, they're they're my West Coast squad that I get down with. I'm genuinely thrilled about what is going on. So just pump the brakes and relax. But we keep it pushing. Uh, the deal that took way too long to happen has finally happened, Deej. The Maryland Whip Snakes have signed midfielder Colin Heacock to a two-year deal through 2025 and one of the funniest lacrosse no-context photos to ever come out uh, was on Matt Rambo's Instagram story with Colin Heacock in front of a bottle service sign. That said, Heacock, whip snakes, question mark, let's go. <laughs> this is just a matter of time. It's we about stopped. damn time. Even the way back with the Heacock on Peacock stuff is when people really first started talking about this. So it literally was only a matter of time. And what more fitting time for when they move back to Maryland? It makes total sense. I am interested to see how it works out with their current midfield and who's there. It's scary. How much are you going to have to pay Tucker Dordovic for that number two? Probably nothing. Tucker probably going to be like, Here, sir. Bro. <laughs> Look, bro, I like the number two, but I understand. <laughs> and, but I'm sure he'll offer him something, you know, yeah. like just being a vet and, and understanding the game. I'm sure he'll offer him something and that'll get all worked out. But I mean, Tucker, you have Brad Smith. You have uh, would also be very fun. Well, I don't know if anybody currently wears it for the whips. It'd be very funny if Heacock wore number six and then him and Rambo were six and nine. Does somebody wear six for them right now? I don't know if uh, is Haas still there. No, John Haas is not there, but he wore 26. I was thinking the same thing. Will Haas wears number six for the outlaws. Right. I don't think anyone wears number six. I'll pull up their roster right now, but would be very funny if they just went six and nine. Hashtag nice. Nice. But I doubt it. He'd probably go back to two. Uh, but he cocked to the whip snakes for two years. Romar Dennis resigns with the Redwoods on a one year deal. That trade for Romar looks better and better as the days go by. I know he didn't have the most illustrious champ series, but I think with the reworked roster, Romar's going to have a a better year than he did last year, regular season wise, um, and just having more pieces around him that fit his play style better. And he's going to get a full season with the Redwoods, like he was acquired late season. He even said it at champ series in one of the press conferences. He's like, "I'm still getting to know these guys," so I like that move a lot there. Uh, the Philadelphia Water Dogs have signed Jake Richard to a one-year deal through 2024. Love this. The, the hometown kid comes home, and I put this on Twitter. I said, it is very rare that in any sport you get to sign a former team captain in free agency, and the Water Dogs just added a former team captain to their locker room that is already littered with leadership. I love this move, adding Jake Richard to that short stick D midi unit. I 
I short stick D mid has become such a position to me that pulls at the heartstrings, right? It's such an important position and, and it's one that's attacked so often. And when you have good ones, they really make a difference. Danny Logan, Bubba Fairman, you know, the Zach Curry or these kind of guys, we've seen them make a serious impact. The water dogs are now loaded there. So now I'm going to be in that position where it's like, well, who's playing and who's not playing this week and, and how like that, that part is going to be tough, but they're absolutely loaded there. And that's a great position to be loaded. And, and that's why it pulls at the heartstrings because the guys who get in and are, and are good, they're there. And they're like, yo, this is awesome. This is amazing. I love watching them play. But then you're like, at the same time, this really good short stick D mid is sitting at home, not getting paid because you're playing. And that's going to be an every week thing with so many of these teams because the D mid talent that's been coming out is unreal. Yeah, the short stick D mid uh, lineup for the Water Dogs now is Charlie Hayes, Jake Higgins, Jake Richard, Christian Scarpello, Matt Witcher. Along with Liam Burns, Eli Gobrek, Ben Randall on the defense. That's nasty. And then that's a good defense. You reunited Jake Richard with Liam Burns from their time at Marquette, along with LSMs, Alex Mazzone, Ryland Reese, Chris Abia. That dog's defense is nasty, bro. <laughs> nasty. They they look good, man. I'm scared. I'm scared. Um, I love this move. I'm happy Jake Richards home. He followed the pod. He followed me, so might try to get Jake Richard on the show soon. Um, I also like this move because played for Team USA as well with Michael Sowers with Kira McCardle. So you have that chemistry there with those guys, just locker room wise. Um, instant leader added to the locker room for the Water Dogs. So big time move for interim GM Andy Copeland to bring Jake Richard home. Uh, one of the big dynamite boomsticks of free agency so far is that the Boston Cannons have added reigning defensive player of the year, Garrett Eppel, on a two-year contract through 2025. That's a big one. I mean, that was basically just a swap for Holden Garland. Um, mm -hmm. But I like that for both yeah. teams. You know, I, I like that for both teams a lot. I think they're both very great cover guys. Um, but like you said, it was just time for change. The, the Redwoods have been rocking with this unit for quite some time, and, and it was time to to move on. Uh, Garrett's great. We're going to miss him in the Redwoods community, but it's time for something new, and Holden Garland is, is, is about as good as it gets on that side. Um, especially when you think about IQ and stick skills, he's a guy who plays NLL, and is great in the NLL. He's in the conversation for Defensive Player of the Year almost every year has the stick skills with the short, but also has them with the long and is great with his feet and, and plays almost lockdown D as a cover guy. So you replace a very good cover guy with another very good cover guy. You add Chris fake to that. You possibly bring back glaze as we're waiting to see if he gets resigned or not. And same thing with uh, John Sexton waiting to see what his deal will be, but you still have Arden Cohen and Owen Grant as well. So the defensive pieces for the Redwoods are coming together, and then you add a guy to the Cannons roster that's cover, cover centric, but is also a guy that's a leader and has been there before, has been in big games, and that's something the Cannons didn't really have on that defensive side. Um, obviously, they had Gitz, but he's on the bench. Brody didn't play this year. When you looked at their defense, it was Holden Garland, Jack Kilty, Jake Pulver. Uh, I feel like I'm missing one. Well, Holden didn't play last year. Which is even better for uh, the point I'm making. But their defense roster, I mean, their defense was good. Is filthy now because let's not forget, I think one of the more forgotten transactions of the offseason is that, um, oh, yeah, Bryce Young is part of this defense now, too. Mm -hmm. Along with, like you said, Jack Guilty. Um, along with 
pulling up their roster. Yeah, so their defense is Garrett Eppel, Jack Kilty, Jake Pulver, Cade Van Raphorst. They just re-signed Max Wayne as we've been recording this episode to a one-year deal, and Bryce Young. And then they also have Finn Sullivan, who's a free agent, uh, waiting to see where he ends up. But that defense is asinine. And that's not even talking about Pat Eslanian, Bubba Fairman, Zach Goodrich, Jeff Trainer, Craig Chick, Ethan Rawl. Like that's that's a scary defense, to say the least. But to your point, holding Garlant going to the Redwoods, kind of in my brain, and tell me if I'm wrong. It kind of remind. I think Holden's going to play the Warren Jeffrey role for the Redwoods defense, how Warren Jeffrey is utilized with the Archers. Kind of. Kind of. Obviously different defensive schemes, but... I think he's going to play more of the Graham Hostick role. I think, because I really do believe Glaze will be re-signed. And Glaze will take over that Warren Jeffrey role because that's his role. That's what Glaze does. Um, minus Glaze, Glaze doesn't resign. I could very much see Holden taking over Glaze's spot, being that middle guy, being the general that's having the conversation, seeing everything, talking everybody through, and, and being that experienced guy. But if Glaze is there, nobody takes his spot. Uh. <laughs> The Philadelphia Water Dogs also extended face of the franchise and the hometown hero, Mikey Sowers, through 2026. Love the move. It was almost a foregone conclusion, and I'm just happy for, for Michael Sowers to uh, get a chance to play in front of his hometown team for the years to come. Yeah, I mean, we we, we saw this one coming. Mikey is arguably the best player in the league. Loves being in Philly, loves playing for the Water Dogs. Um, and it was kind of just one of those things where I think, uh, like you mentioned, Andy kind of tied this one up for the next guy coming in so he doesn't have too much to worry about. The New York Atlas have signed Champ Series darling and future guest of the program, midfielder Ronan Jacoby, to a one year deal through 2024. Stoked for Ronan. Like he deserves this so much earned it through champ series and now is going to get a chance to play with the Atlas. Um, I think he fits what they're going to do offensively very, very well. He's going to get to play alongside Brian Costabile, get to play with Jeff T play with Chris gray. I think he's going to be awesome in that midfield for the Atlas. The Atlas, I'm telling you that the Atlas offense is going to be crazy, especially depending on who they're able to draft. Because like I said, this is an offensive heavy draft, so there will be plenty of pieces no matter what round it is they're looking in. And it's only going to get better. It's only going to get better. It, it's oh, Brian Costabile going back it was crazy. Was it? it I kind of saw it coming. Well, crazy in the sense of like everybody thought he was about to bounce out. Yeah. I, yeah. I kind of saw it coming because. He kind of started to warm back up at the end of that season. And him and T are, they're honestly great together. And, and him you, and Chris Greasy together are crazy. So you have Chris Gray, and then you're going to add another piece to that. Xander Dixon's a cutter guy. You got your feeder and Eric Law. Like him, it, Brian Costable leaving would have left a huge gap in their offense. Mm -hmm. And I think he understood kind of where he is. He plays a much bigger role than some of the other teams if he had a chance of leaving mm -hmm. that, not that he had a chance, but if he goes to another team, he's probably playing a lesser role, still very significant and still inputting, but he's right now top three option. And I think even if you draft the guy, that doesn't change. We go T gray Costabile. Probably T Costabile gray. I think, I think Chris gray really benefits off of, having those two there because when they run through the attack, it's mostly through T. And then if it's not T, it's normally Eric Law. But then mm -hmm. when they run through the midfield, if it's it's Costabile, if it's not Costabile, it's Brendan Curry a lot of the times. So and Xander Dixon. And Xander Dick but Xander Dixon isn't dodging too much. He's really mm -hmm. kind of that slasher guy picking up loose balls. Very much a uh 
Jay Carlson type player. Mm -hmm. So he's in a position where it's when we want to go through the midfield, they're calling my number. But if he goes to say the Redwoods, there's no guarantee he's the call guy for the midfield. Him going to Cannons, there's no guarantee he's the call guy from the midfield. They love running through Matt Campbell and and mm -hmm. uh, Aslanian. He's in a position in the spot where he's in to be a top three guy and get his number called consistently, and I think that's part of what got him to stay. I also totally forgot Connor Kirst is now on the Cannons because he was part of the Bryce Young trade. Mm, you're right. Adding um, mid repertoire that they have over there. Yeah, along with producer Donnie, Chris Aslani, and Campbell, Ryan Drenner. Um, But speaking of midfields and speaking of the Redwoods, uh, one of the more foregone conclusions that was going to happen, Redwoods sign, Champ Series darling, Ricky Miazon to a two-year deal through 2025. Uh, we knew this was coming. I knew this was coming during Champ Series, the way that they spoke about Ricky. Um was astronomical and Ricky was on their draft board to go and scout before the NCAA revoked his year of eligibility. Uh, so they got it. They got an up close and personal look at him at champ series and then got the, the first dibs to, to sign him. signs a two year deal. I am very, 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 very excited for Ricky's opportunity here. I think he fits that Redwoods team so well He's going to play very well with Romar in that midfield. And uh, again, Redwoods fans, just breathe. Just breathe. You're going to, uh, Ricky's awesome. He, he was so fun to, I got a couple opportunities just to say what's up to him throughout Champ Series. He's so likable. And uh, it's a guy that, you know, has California roots, obviously playing at Stanford for football. So that's a, a big time boost there for like community immersion. For the Redwoods, so love that for Ricky, and I love it for the Woods. I like Ricky a lot, um, and I think he really replaces Sergio Perkovic and, and that role that they were playing him in where it's like, hey, go out, play a couple solid minutes in a row where you're back and forth playing D, playing O, getting your opportunities where they are, and he's going to do that alongside Nakai. Him and Nak together are going to be great, and it doesn't matter what – other person you put next to him, it's going to work out. And, and I'm really excited to see the Woods get into that atmosphere where they're trying to have a two-way centric midfield. Perfect example is the Water Dogs. Almost everybody in with a short stick on the Water Dogs can go both ways and has mm -hmm. the skills to be good going both ways. That's important in the PLL with how fast the game is right now, the shortened field, the shot clock, all of that the Woods are starting to enter that realm where they're looking at two-way midfielders and it's working out, which is why I tell all young kids, especially the ones I coach, if you have a short stick, play both ends because coaches aren't looking for O-mids and D-mids anymore. They're looking for midfielders, lacrosse players who can do whatever it is that they're asking for. Another example and, is Ian McKay. And Ian McKay and Ricky M Miazon is a perfect example of a midfielder that can do whatever it is you're asking for. Um, the Redwoods, we mentioned it a little bit, two-year deal for Holden Garland in free agency, um, did not play last year, uh, but was on the Cannons roster. The picture that our good pal Chase from the PLL Pipeline posted of Holden, I looked at it and I was like, when did Jay Carlson wear a Cannons uniform? Holden's face in this picture looks exactly like Juicy J. Um, but I love this move. We talked about it a little bit of what this means for, for them. Um, big time signing for the Redwoods. I love that move for them. Uh, some coaching free agency news. This comes from Dan Arestia. Um, the Water Dogs will be conducting coaching interviews this week. Um, and some of the names that were listed were Stephen Brooks, who we mentioned on last week's pod, um, as a potential interview candidate. Obviously, he's coaching the Japan All Stars. Uh, in a couple weeks as well and was the interim coach during the champ series last year for atlas um the other name that was name dropped was stony brook women's lacrosse coach joe spalina listener of the program 
I... former, former head coach of the New York Lizards as well, so he has coaching experience at the pro level. Um, I'm very intrigued. Call me Poppy from <laughs> Highly Question. CC, I'm very intrigued. I don't have much to say on this topic yet. Um, I think I'm just more interested in seeing who gets the job. Like the 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 before antics for me in in coaching scenario, like coaching searches, are never that big of a deal to me. Um, it doesn't matter the sport, doesn't matter the the team, the coach, the kid. It's whatever you're gonna look at a number of candidates, and I'm gonna have my favorites out of that. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the one you choose and how I feel about that one. So I like. What I'll say is I like the options a lot. They, I think they're picking amazing options that have experience, know the game, pay attention to the PLL and what they're trying to do at the current moment. And, and I think um, they're staying away from tone-deaf coaches in terms of where the league is going, in terms mm -hmm. of being player-oriented, fan-oriented, and the experience and everything that comes with the PLL. They're very diligent about picking – coaches that are not tone deaf to that and will help advance that. So I, I so far like all of the options and I'm just intrigued to see which one ends up getting the job. So then I can truly go into my deep dive analysis of why or why not. And in, in there, I, I should reiterate these are those two names are among the candidates. There are other candidates that were not name dropped by Dan. Um, my biggest thing here is you're not only hiring a head coach, you're hiring a GM as well. That's the part that you have to get correct when you're attempting to replace Andy Copeland. Is you are you need the GM brain to be just as good, if not better, than the head coaching brain that you're bringing in. You're going to have a coaching staff with you, but at the end of the day, you're the, the person pushing the buttons as the GM. So that brain has to be as locked in as the head coaching brain is, if not more. So it's intriguing. Um, I love the video of Joe Spelina hitting Joey's celebration in the locker room with the Stony Brook team after their win, um, which was like, God damn, he would fit this, this city so fucking well. Um, but yeah, I'm super intrigued by... Uh, who's going to get the job and we'll see how that continues to progress more free agency news. I know this is a long episode, but it's the first round of free agency. Uh, PLL championship game, darling Reed Bowering signs a one year deal with the New York Atlas. According to our good friend, Chris Rosenthal, you want to talk about options. You want to talk about shooters. Atlas are just bringing in all the options. You said, uh, huh? Reed Bowering to Atlas. Oh, I hate that for him. I think I said <laughs> you. Actually, I think I said you to you when it happened. Like, I get it. And he will help their midfield and, and be an amazing option for them. A dozing piece that can also play on the inside, do some defense. But the Archers were such a perfect fit for him. I the thought he was going to play. But it, I know. That's why I, I hate the whole situation for him. Archers are a perfect fit, but he wasn't really going to play there. But I don't feel like Atlas was the move for him, although he will be helpful for them as well. It was just kind of a damn win-win, lose-lose situation because he wins in both pieces, but he loses in both pieces in my, you know, in my opinion as well. So it's like, okay, like uh -huh. I, I don't even know. Does he crack the roster with, with Atlas? I think he will. Will he crack the 30% threshold? That remains to be seen. Um, but I think he'll play. Mm -hmm. um, California Redwoods re-signed the captain, Isaiah Davis Allen, to a two-year deal through 2025, uh, as first reported by you and I's text messages. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> Facts. Um, love that IDA. Just fits the Redwoods culture and roster to a T and you don't let your captain walk out the door. Cough, cough, Jake Richard. Shout out <laughs> to you coming home. Um, the Boston Cannons have signed Tucci Maine, Zach Tucci to a one-year deal. That was a, an obvious move for them needing a face-off guy. He's from the area. Uh, he's a New Hampshire native. So 
kind of a foregone conclusion there. Uh, we touched on it a little bit, but the California Redwoods signed defenseman Chris Fake to a two-year deal through 2025. He was a 30% threshold guy, didn't crack the roster for more than three games for the Water Dogs, so he became a free agent. Um, this always felt like a, a match made for each other, and we were like, Water Dogs? Notre Dame defenseman? What? It always felt like Chris Fake would end up being on the Redwoods one way or another. I think he's going to get a, a big time opportunity with the Redwoods and he fits their defensive scheming really well with what Chris Collins does. Um, so I love that for Chris Fake and I love that for the Redwoods. The other moves that have come through, according to our pal Chris Rosenthal and our text messages, Deej, uh, the Carolina Chaos have re signed our good pal Pat Resch through 2024. Uh, the Water Dogs have re signed, or I should say, extended Ryan Conrad through 2025. Uh, he was signed through 2024, but he gets a, another additional year on the contract there. Carolina Chaos extended attackman Josh Byrne, friend of the program, through 2026. And then, obviously, the news that we broke earlier on the show. Jack Kelly signs through 2025 with the Redwoods and our guy Blaze Reardon gets extended through 2026 uh, with the chaos. Johnny Serdick has re-signed with chaos and Max Wayne has re-signed with the cannons. And that is round one of PLL free agency. Biggest surprise and biggest, uh, biggest splash. In free Big, agency so far for you. Biggest splash is the Carolina Chaos. They just came in, and, and I don't think they're going to make too many more moves moving forward. They're just like, hey, uh, <laughs> I know how AT gets, but like, there just ain't that much room on the roster. Well, they, <laughs> they still have a bunch of their own guys that they got to re-sign. That ain't big deal to me. Like, re re-signing versus signing a new piece. Signing a new that piece. That are technically free agents, I should say. Yeah, like signing a new piece is a much bigger deal. I don't see them signing too many nor like more new pieces. That's just the AT mind. Like he's like, hey, I need these pieces. I want I want these pieces. I'm gonna go get them right away. We've seen this kind of that's just how he works. When he wants something, he goes and gets it. So chaos coming out of the box was no surprise, but they're the biggest splash, biggest movers. You know my biggest surprise. Seeing the boy walk out the door was crazy. Jaw dropped when that happened. I was like, GE 52 is out of here? Nah. Nah. But then we got Holden and Chris, and I was like, okay, makes sense. But yeah, that was that was probably the biggest surprise for me was seeing him two step it. And also seeing Atlas sign Tim Troutner. Like, I didn't think anybody was like that interested in Timmy T. Um, if that's the case, I thought we would have tried to ship him away. But who would have taken him when they could have just gotten him as a free agent at the end of the year. So I get that piece too. I think my biggest splash so far is the cannons signing Garrett Apple. That's a huge move to bolster that defense. Um, that is just like, it makes my brain go in a million different directions. Um, also a big surprise. I would say is Garrett Apple going to the cannons. Um, the other big, Splash, I should say, um, as I scroll through here, <sighs> it, it doesn't feel like a big splash, but I think the Redwoods getting Chris Fake is going to be severely underlooked right now and people are going to be very surprised at how well he plays for them okay and obviously the most unsurprising move is colin heacock to the whips <laughs> yeah that that one was clear as day and i also don't i wasn't very surprised like also I for brian big, big splash move that I think could go really well as long as he kind of rebounds a little bit. 
Jewels to Chaos is very fun. You really want to talk about this? <laughs> it's a good move, man. It's a good move. Oh, I know, but it's it's a painful one. That was the one piece I feel like the Redwoods definitely should have hung on to outside of Ryder Garnsey. Which we're still waiting on that. Which when it was time to dodge, if it wasn't Ryder, it was going to be Jules. So that was my piece on that and, and wanting him to stay in a Redwoods jersey. is He created offense. So hopefully also, we can find a way to replace that. I got a little insight on why Kevin Rogers chose to sign with Chaos per source here. Um, allegedly, according to source, Kevin Rogers was had a decision to make between Chaos and Atlas. And he picked Chaos because... Chaos said that he would fit well with the Canadian style of offense that they run and that he'd actually be on a roster every week. So to me, Kevin Rogers to Chaos is your 2024 Ryan Smith replacement because Ryan Smith was placed on the holdout list. He's more than likely playing in the, uh, the national box across championship that happens at the end of the PLL season. So he wouldn't be able to play both. Kevin Rogers feels like the replacement there by that reasoning. Oh, the Ryan Smith replacement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have to go out and get somebody to replace him. So I don't know if I would have gone with Kevin Rogers, but I understand why they did. Mm hmm. I think he fits them really well, too. I think he's going to play, as long as they re-sign KJ, I think he plays really well with KJ. I just think there's some pieces I would have gone after first, I should say, over Kevin Rogers. Well, they did. They went after Jules first. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, before signing Kevin, I would have been like, hey, let's go after X, Y, and Z. But that, I, I don't, I don't, I'm me. a big Kevin Rogers guy. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm not. I think he's very underrated in just the the PLL scape. Mm -hmm. So, his third team in the PLL. As we try and see who gets to end up playing for every single team. Um, did you were boots on the ground college wise? I was, week. and what a crazy game to be boots on the ground for not only because of the actual game but because i saw like a thousand of my players there through your tomahawk players. shades through your tomahawk shades the oh, best oh. small batch of eyewear in the game from sunglasses to blue light glasses and prescription lenses tomahawk shades has you covered deej was obviously wearing them boots on the ground i've been wearing them all the time. They protect my eyes when I'm editing with the blue light glasses, when I'm outside with the sunglasses. They can do the same for you. Download the Tomahawk Shades app in the App Store or Google Play Store or go to TomahawkShades.com. Fill up your cart, get everything you need. And when you go to check out, use code USP for 25% off your order from our pals at Tomahawk Shades. That's code USP at TomahawkShades.com or in the Tomahawk Shades app for 25% off your order. Tom Hawk Shades owned by Chris Hogan, Kyle Harrison. Ever heard of them? Go get your sunnies, your blue lights. Be styling and profiling for a fraction of the price of the big eyewear companies. TomahawkShades.com, code USP for 25% off your order. Lay it on me, Deej. Yeah, I saw about a million of my players between travel and, and high school at this game, at the Maryland Notre Dame game. So that was awesome. Uh, the experience was awesome there as well. Going back to the last couple of weeks, Double overtime uh, last Friday. Cleveland State over Canisius 10-9. That was the same night that Penn shocked the world and beat Duke. And then the Ivy Leagues are a coming. Because Princeton also beat North Carolina that night 15-9. Obviously, Penn scores by 14-12 in the upset. That Saturday, obviously, tons of motion going on. Shout out, Brian, Liam. And the rest of my Michigan Wolverine supporters, we win the winged helmet battle again. We're currently four and three all time against Delaware in the winged helmet battle. 
Tell them take them things off because we the real wings around here. They, the Michigan comes out big, 13-9 in that game. Cornell over Ohio State, 15-11. to Colgate absolutely shocks Loyola, Maryland, who's been playing great ball this year. Jacksonville stomps all over St. John's, 24-7. to Your Nova boys over Lehigh, 14-8. Penn State gets the OT dub against Yale, which was a phenomenal game if you didn't get a chance to watch that. Syracuse trumped all over High Point, 1913. Uh, Townsend, no, they don't own Maryland right now. That's Hopkins, but Townsend did win over the weekend, 17-7. Hopkins over Virginia, 16-14. Stand up, Balti. JHU putting on as the only Division Three school to be playing Division One lacrosse. And they look damn good doing it as the two seed in the country. Uh, Monmouth and Mount St. Mary's went to overtime, double overtime. Monmouth wins 13 uh, 12. Georgetown over Brown 11 5. NJIT, state of New Jersey, raised the goddamn roof. 15 5 dub. They're still undefeated on the year. Utah wins a close one in the Big East over Marquette 9 8. UMass outlasts Albany 12-11. And, and Denver still rolling as they get a 15-6 dub over LeMoyne. They also look really good on the year. Duke bounces back and takes care of Princeton. Also, North Carolina bounces back and takes care of Penn. Duke 17-8, North Carolina 13-9. Obviously, the game that I, I was at was fantastic. Best game of the weekend. Notre Dame, Maryland, unreal. Pat Cav over the head. Jake Taylor doing his thing, Jordan Fajon and uh and, and the Notre Dame football team there in action as well. So that was awesome to see all those guys down there going crazy. Some of them probably seeing lacrosse for the first time. It was an experience that they seem to have thoroughly enjoyed. Um and, and Notre Dame comes out winners 14-9. St. Joe puts it on Air Force 15-11. And, and and West Point makes sure that the uh The Academies come out of the weekend with a win, taking down Lafayette 16-11. Army also coming in as the country's number one team for TLN. Okay, people, I see y'all. Nova with a double overtime dub over Drexel 13-12. Another uh, battle for Philly. Uh, Binghamton. I have have breaking news. Breaking news. According to the official California Redwoods Twitter account, they have extended attackman Ryan Lee through 2024. Okay. Not the attackman I wanted to see uh, extended, but we'll we'll touch on that later. Uh, uh, Rutgers still rolling, 17-5 over Detroit Mercy. Binghamton gets another OT dub over Mount St. Mary's, 13-12. Tough week for the Mount. Uh, Georgetown, 14-8 over High Point. Virginia, 16-7 over Robert Morris. Nothing good happening tomorrow or tonight as you listen to this on Friday, most likely. Um, Saturday, High Point Jacksonville is going to be great. I think we're going to start to see some conference action going down uh, pretty soon. Virginia takes on Towson. Penn plays Villanova. North Carolina's got Hofstra. NJIT taking on Lindenwood, looking to stay perfect as NJIT. Lindenwood looking for their first win of the year. Duke and Loyola will battle over in Maryland. Brown will visit Maryland. Notre Dame's going over to that state I dislike so much to play the Buckeyes. Cornell and Penn State should be an all-time banger over in Happy Valley. John Hopkins traveling up to the Dome to take on Cuse as well on Saturday. Sunday, we got some bangers. Yale and Denver will be amazing. Harvard and Michigan's always a game to watch every year. Princeton and Rutgers battling for Jersey. Drexel and St. Joe taking things for another run in the Philly banter. Hampton will look to get their first win of the year Tuesday against High Point. Duke plays Providence on Wednesday, and that'll wrap it up for the week. Plenty of good games to watch all weekend between NLL and college ball. Uh, oh, Carolina Chaos yeah. have officially announced as well uh, that Pat Resch has re-signed. And the caption on the tweet, more resh, more life. <laughs> more resh, more life. Love that for Pat. Um, 
that's all we got for you guys on this episode. If any breaking news comes through, Deej and I will more than likely have videos for you across socials and we'll have graphics going out uh, if it comes through. But that's why you got to listen to the pod. Subscribe. Follow us at OTB Lags Pod, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Threads, Facebook.com slash Underground Sports PHI. Uh, and of course, Follow DJ on Twitter at SCS underscore next great. Follow me at KBIZZL311. Subscribe to the podcast feed on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts in audio form. Uh, it really does help the show continue to grow, helps more people find outside the box and underground sports Philadelphia as a whole. Subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Underground Sports Philadelphia. It's where you get full video episodes of this show every single week, full video episodes of every show in our network. And for the OTB radio interviews in video form, subscribe to the Outside the Box podcast YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at OTB Laxpod. Let's see how many subscribers that YouTube channel gets by the next time we record, Deej. I like that. Let's do it. I like that a lot. And of course, 30. 30? Can we get to 30? Can we get to 30? We're already at 10. Um, be sure in 10 days, St. Patrick's Day, we will have our annual selection Sunday live stream featuring yours truly, featuring my boy Deej, and featuring two very drunk idiots, Stephen McAvoy and Pat Pitts, as we break down the bracket for March Madness. Join the Underground Sports Philadelphia Bracket Challenge. It is linked in the description uh, on audio and on YouTube. We want this thing to be as big as possible. So join the Bracket Challenge. We'll be tweeting it out. It'll be in your faces. Be sure to join the Bracket Challenge. Uh, and, of course, get your merch, phiapparel.co, code underground, 10% off your order. And this has been episode number 313 of the award nominated, honorably mentioned, number nine NCAA ranked, and of course, viewable on YouTube, Outside the Box Podcast, the official lacrosse podcast on the Underground Sports Philadelphia Podcast Network for DJM KB. Shout out to the boys signing new contracts and getting extended. Enjoy this weekend of lacrosse, and we'll catch you guys next time. Peace. Deuces.